All right. So um, let's get into it. Let's start the video. And uh, and um, again, if you guys in the chats have any questions as we're going, uh, feel free and we'll we'll be your conduit and ask them uh, to David. All right. Here we go. Uh, it, so eight foot by what room? <laughs> um, the, the room itself is 12 feet square and eight feet high. Okay. And here here we are in our... 12 feet square and eight feet high. I instantly have a question, David. What is that grid? Like, is that in Blender as well? The, like this rotatable one? Oh, Those are the ones on the that. disc, aren't they? Um, hmm? Those are the ones on the disc, right? Uh, no, no. This is, oh, no. Uh, this is one that I created uh, just for this scene. OK. So this just gives you a view of the CG figure, uh, you know, rotated. And here's one view. Uh, oh, so you want to do this analog or? And I'm going to start drawing any any second now. Okay. But you're doing this analog? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. I've, I've done uh, digital ones, but uh, I'm actually... Kind of old school. I'm much more comfortable oh, yeah. on paper. Yeah, uh, you could you could certainly do this, uh, you know, in Photoshop, you know, or or whatever drawing program. What's the, what's the one that people like? Uh, Procreate. A lot of people Paint. use Clip Studio Paint, Procreate, Fresco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, Clip Studio. I I now I I mean I'm doing most of if I do perspective now I use Clip Studio Paint. They've got some really good perspective tools. But this this brings me back to my first art job was at an architectural firm. And that's kind of where I learned perspective because we had to do that's basically all we did was uh, design like storefronts and things like that and ah. interiors and food courts. And I never drew so many ch drawing chairs in perspective. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, 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 a food court. pretty simple. Well, they are simple, but just all the, the, the legs. And then when you have to draw so many of them, I just. Ah. <laughs> I feel like when you get into cylinders and then when you get into um, the one that blows my mind still to this day, um, vividly from your perspective books, is, is the sequence where they're talking about how difficult it is to map out a spiral staircase. <laughs> and you have your characters walking on a drawn, a very perfectly drawn spiral staircase well and then there's like six to nine pages of how to make the spiral staircase too it's yes. incredible and i don't know how often that comes up but i guess what do architects still like putting spiral staircases in in their uh, food courts I, that that was back in the 90s when i worked at the architectural firm so i don't know <laughs> i imagine it's all uh it's all cad now Oh yeah. yeah, definitely. But back when I was doing it, it wasn't. Yeah, I mean, there were people working on CAD, but you know, the the two uh, illustrators on staff, um, we both we both used all traditional stuff. But we would have. I probably have them. I could pull them out. But like we had, you know, big blueprint size perspective grids that we would use. You know, and we you know pull them over a big giant drafting table, and you stick the pens on either end, and then you take your straight edge and move it up and down. To, yeah. Is that kind of how you create yours, or? Yeah, I have a couple of, I have a couple of uh, perspective grids, like big architectural ones that I bought in the eighties. Yeah, you know, before you know, way before computers and before I started designing my own. Um, but one of the first ones I I created on my own was uh, a cylindrical perspective grid because there there weren't any commercially available, and I had. Uh, I, you know, I, I'd been uh, very turned on by, you know, examples that I'd seen in Escher particularly. And uh, there was a book called The Magic Mirror of M.C. Escher that actually outlined the geometry behind cylindrical perspective. So I just created a big grid that uh, I yeah, used from time to time. It's awesome. So, this... This may sound like a, <laughs> I probably should know this. So, so what's the difference between cylindrical perspective and cur 
curvilinear. Is it curvilinear? Cur um, well, okay. Uh, curvilinear perspective is, you know, a kind of perspective where you draw a straight line curve. Right. Um, and there are two main types. Um, cylindrical perspective and fishnet perspective. And the difference between cylindrical perspective and fishnet perspective is that um, in, cylind in cylindrical perspective, uh, the vertical lines are straight. Okay. okay. And in fisheye perspective, you know, yeah, basically all the all the lines curve. Huh. That's that's cool. I actually didn't know the difference there either. I was afraid to um, ask because I said like I thought no, no, it's no. probably something I should know. So well, <laughs> so I mean, back me up if you think of the difference between one of those panoramas like a, you know a, like a, like an old group photo yeah that's usually a cylindrical perspective yeah and then fish eyes obviously if you're looking into it like a sphere or something right right yeah, yeah. and and um you know a, a cylindrical perspective is typically much 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 wider than it is tall and you know a fisheye perspective is is, is usually you know, it's round or it's cut down to a square. Got it. Uh, Gary Hodge is in the chat. Uh, it isn't a question, but it's a, a terrible joke, and I have to read terrible jokes. He said, I am also a master of perspective. Don't sweat the small stuff. And then he said, <laughs> he said he'll be playing Frank Sal Salazar this evening. <laughs> so Frank is our, our guest who's usually uh, making, guy, making and, uh... bad dad jokes uh, through most of our streams. Um, but uh, well, well played, Gary. Um, yeah, I so I, I think it might be valuable for people who are I, I think we're all pretty familiar with like um, the idea of like printing blue lines or something like that to draw over. But there might be people, um, per, you know, watching this uh, who aren't. So do we want to kind of walk through like why um, you're printing things out like and why you pick that tone? Uh, oh, color. well, I mean, this is this is real inside stuff, but okay, so I mean, you saw the, the video sequence at the top that's in full color. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that that I could draw over, but I, I prefer something fainter. So, um, you know, I I'll, I reduce, you know, I, I manipulate the curves in Photoshop so that uh, the darks aren't so quite so dark and you know and i just make it monochrome because that's kind of easier to deal with um and and this you know magenta tone is nice uh just because when it comes to scan the art um you know eventually i'm going to be inking over this so it's very easy to separate that reddish magenta tone from the black of, of the ink. It's less easy with, with blue. Sometimes the darkest blues will, will read as black to Photoshop. It's it's so bizarre because it's so polar opposite of the way it used to be when it was when it was photocopies because yeah. red photographs pretty much photographs black and blue doesn't. So it's it's like it's it's very but I did notice that and I don't know why it, this time was any different than before, but when I scanned, I just I did uh the artwork for my cover uh, for the comic I'm working on and I did it blue line and I was having a heck of a time like you said David getting rid of those blue lines I had to go back and physically like go and like airbrush some of them out that just I couldn't couldn't get rid of yeah which, yeah, which so was because I hadn't had that problem before so I don't know what the difference was but it's yeah. kind of like it's kind of like in film if you're shooting on actual film you want a blue screen but if you're shooting on digital then you want a green screen there's some something about the way that the color is processed is interesting. I don't know. That's cool. Um, I, I I've used the blue technique, um, but the problem with the blue as opposed to the magenta <clears throat> is if you're gonna use blue nowadays, it's like you have to have it like ten or twenty percent cyan, and that's not really giving you a lot. So you're really gonna have to like squint to see that like mm -hmm. you know printed out. Um, so I, I honestly hadn't tried doing magenta. So now I'm kind of excited. I feel like I've learned something new yeah, already. I, and, you know, sometimes uh, when, when I'm doing a big project, 
which I haven't done in a while. I mean, I haven't done a, a, a big drawn project in a while. Um, sometimes I will mix it up, like print out one page. I, like I'll, I'll do uh, my preliminary work uh, on computer and uh, I'll, I'll print out my, my rough, you know, in blue or in magenta or in yellow or, you know, sometimes a pale green just because I, I, I don't want to use up the uh, ink in my printer unevenly. Yeah, that's actually a fairly good reason because, um, man, the, the, like I'm right now in the middle of um, doing a historical graphic novel that requires a bunch of like comping and I'm doing the whole thing digitally. Uh -huh. But, but when, but when you're, you're not doing any ink at all, nothing on paper? Um, no, it's, it's, it's going to be full digital for this one. Uh -huh. And it's weird because part of why I'm doing it digital is that I want it to look more traditional than my traditional stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's like, I'm kind of using like an Arnold Lobel technique where it's like rendered pencil with flat color underneath. And actually that's a lot quicker to do digitally. Um, but, but what I still just being the guy who likes the traditional stuff, I still have to be like printing it out so I can watch the page spread as I'm building it and like kind of lay out my, my spreads to watch uh, mm -hmm. and check out. But man, that burns through, like it's amazing how quick inkjet printers will just suck through a, um, a, a, a print, you know? Um, Ooh, and so, you yeah. know, it, what might help um, print it out on slicker paper. Ooh, good point. I should stop using the cheap office paper. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's a false economy, considering you know paper is cheap and ink is expensive. Ah, oh, that's so. Yeah, I mean, I use. Uh, well, I guess I. I always preferred like a cold press. To, most people like hot press, but I always preferred cold press because I like that tooth. But it does suck up that ink. But mm -hmm. lately, I've been using a. I think it's a hammer mill cardstock. And it's a little flimsier than a, bl a Bristol board, but it is it is fairly smooth and it, it seems to it seems to work really good with the ink. Nice. Um, so at this point, what are you mapping out um, on the grid? It seems like you found your center point, right? And you're kind of mapping out different. Uh, explain what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, it looks like what I'm doing now is. Uh... Am I still on the? Oh, you're doing. It looks title? like you're doing lettering, or was that? Already I think I'm doing the lettering on top. Yeah, yeah. So, so this obviously, is, you know, the the the, uh, the series that I'm doing, uh, which which are all uh, based on on these perspective grids, is called random haiku, and I'm just uh, so so the the common denominator is the dialogue is always in haiku, and so far I've, I've done you know lone figures, so. So uh, this this actually keeps me from having to uh, you know do an, an area in extensive perspective uh, you know because the title is just lettering and sometimes there will be a little bit of perspective to it you know like I'll have it sort of generally uh, following the the direction of, of, of lines I usually have it uh, uh, facing front, but, uh, but receding a little bit along with the perspective lines. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, I'm still doing that. I love so it. I though. haven't actually really begun to draw in perspective yet. I told you this is, this is a slow burn. That's okay though. I'm, I'm kind of excited about, um, even the hand lettering process. Um, cause I, I delve in that a bit and, uh, it's, it is interesting when you're building letters, um, this is just a tip for anybody out there, when you're building like custom typography, um, a lot of it is demystified a bit if you kind of view it like, if you're if you're coming at it from an illustrator's perspective, and uh, for me, like the big block for me with hand lettering for the longest time was the fact that I viewed myself as an illustrator and not a designer. Um, and and I remember even having type in school, like typography and just being like, I just didn't get kerning. Something unlocked like about a decade ago okay. for me. There we go. 
Oh, am I? Did I freeze? Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, something unlocked about a decade ago for me, where um, where I just started viewing letters as like a figure, and the second I just kind of connected that and started realizing you're just drawing the anatomy of a letter as mm -hmm. opposed to the anatomy of a person. Uh, it kind of unlocked a thing where suddenly like kerning and um, typography became really interesting. And, and I love hand lettering and I encourage you guys to do it um, for multiple reasons, including what David was uh, just saying about it. It also saves you a lot of drawing time in comics because if you're drawing everything and then placing lettering over it, you're losing like productivity and time because you might, be drawing like perspective that's beautiful on a lamp that's going to be covered by type you know and it's like a shame <laughs> like why waste the time drawing that lamp like your your type's going to be right there so type well, placement at the beginning smart yeah yeah, yeah. You know, i now earlier in this random perspective or random haiku uh series i was doing uh lettering that followed the perspective of the scene but I found that, uh, you know, it, unless it's one point perspective, it's really hard to integrate the lettering in, in a way that makes sense as design. Like I, I just wound up with these, you know, triangular spaces at, at the top because, you know, the lettering would be going that way, it would be, you know, tilting away from you. And then I'd have to go, you know, add the second word like haiku going another direction and it was just way you know way too hard yeah you know will eisner could do that kind of thing and, and make it look good um but it, it wasn't something i i was terribly good at or or all that interested in getting better at yeah so now if i can you... do it as frontal as frontal as i can if you guys check out like the spirit, though, like those original covers, it's just insane what Eisner would do with type. But also, I I don't know, um, Scott, Corey, do you guys have the patience to do Will Eisner style type, <laughs> like in perspective? Uh, I don't I know. No. I love it, and uh, I, that's something I would want to tackle someday once because <laughs> it's so cool. You know, I, but you know, I uh, might do that sometime. Just just as a as an exercise yeah I've, just to, just to see how cute i could get with it yeah i have yeah. a feeling that david if you if all four of us tried it i i have a feeling just a suspicion you'd probably be able to nail it <laughs> like the, the best George <laughs> you know? did uh i think he he did dimensional lettering too i mean not with the same sort of perspective rigor but he, he liked to to turn his uh, his lettering into an object in the scene. Yeah, I think um, one of the things I like with the, you know, I, I saw a little bit of a sneak preview of of some of the ones you're going to be uh, th th that you had uh, short videos of, and um, it I do like the fact that on the random haikus you're changing up the lettering, and it did actually remind me of like Harriman or like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like early strips where people would kind of take a title and be more playful with it, um, which I'm glad to see because I do kind of feel like in comics, that's something people should do more often. Like you, you have this title space. Why not play with it and like try different approaches rather than keeping like the same title treatment every time, you know, well, you know, deadlines. Yes. <laughs> there's that, you know, if you're doing it daily, you know, there, there's no reason not to just, you know, glue a photocopy in yeah a daily schedule i can't imagine uh maintaining that honestly no no well i'm on a i'm on a two-week schedule with with these although uh i do other strips for my patreon page um you know uh and i try to get two things up a week you know just you know i just for uh you know my own sense of conscientiousness i try to post something Monday and, and something Thursday. And uh, sometimes there'll be one of these or sometimes there'll be uh, just a, a little strip that's palindromes or uh, what I've been doing a lot of lately are uh, strips that are that are basically book reports 
drawn on the back of a library call slip. You know that, you know that tiny, I, if, you, if you go to the library and you put a hold on a book, um, there'll be a little, little white slip inside the book that has your name on it and the name of the book. And I, I used to use those as bookmarks and throw them away, but now I just draw a, a, a little comic, you know, per, uh, inspired by the book on the back of it and post it. And those take me no time at all. I, I did one today and it, I, I think I, you know, I, I, I drew it in the morning and, and scanned it, you know, right before lunch. That's awesome. Um, I, I, I've had this theory about cartooning, David, and maybe, uh, maybe you can correct me on it. Um, I kind of think most cartoonists, like, I think we have a little bit of, um, uh, like a, a bad memory in the, it, it, like kind of similar to like somebody who went through like giving birth or something where it's like, I, um, not, not at all similar in the sense. I mean, obviously that's a much harder thing to do, but the point being like, people who gave birth do it again and it's such a brutally terrible thing to go through um but it's obviously like there there's something that happens with the memory from the 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 worst of it that just i think fades away so that you're able to kind of do it again i feel like comics have a bit of that too because i constantly am catching myself like when i start a page um i'm like okay, I, I'm going to do, I'm going to rough this page out. It's going to take about like, you know, 30 minutes, two hours later. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, these roughs are done. Then I'm like, oh, I'll start a page. It'll take me like eight hours, 17 hours later. I'm like, okay, maybe not eight hours. I don't okay. know. Do you catch, do you catch yourself doing that? I, I find that I do that all the time with, with yeah, comics. I think, well, I, I think we're all, uh, bad at estimating how long something is going to take. This this particular uh, this particular piece is probably one of the longest, um, just because I got a little fancy and uh, and threw in a, a revolving door. I think that's why you picked this one. You really like the the, the, yeah. the revolving door. Well, I feel like. Um you have a very strong handle on perspective. And I feel like when you do a, something like a revolving door, I think that's good for our viewers to kind of see the gauntlet like laid mm -hmm. down, like, okay, yeah, it, David very quickly and easily does a revolving door, um, which is insane. I mean, it's, it's insanely impressive. It's well, very now cool. Have you watched the full length? Cause <laughs> I, I know you watched the one that's like five minutes long. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. I don't know what that looks like in real time. So this might be demystifying the process for me, which, which will be well, encouraging. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to just demystify the process. I, you know, I mean, there's, there's enough mysticism to how I get to the perspective grids in the first place. Um, but I, I just wanted to make it very clear, you know, how you can use them. So. I am, uh, I am fascinated by the, th the three dimensional kind of rotational customizable, uh, grid. That's interesting to me. That's mm -hmm. cool. Now, do you, do you work in, in CG at all? I have not, I need to, I, it's a, it's a skill I need to pick up. I've, I've had a uh, art direct CG and, um, so I can, view it and do very mild edits but um mm -hmm. but it, it in the most part it's it's a um a thing i'm not as familiar with yeah, actually i'd be know. pretty open to like um tips on like a a kind of intuitive version of of it or is it not really intuitive you just kind of have to play with it uh, you know i'm having to learn uh, a new application uh you know this this figure and perspective project. Um, I, I, I had been working in Lightwave, which is very old school. <laughs> uh, I've been working in Lightwave since like 1999 and never doing animation, but just kind of building scenes like this. And when I started doing the, the figures in Nomad, um, I was frustrated because uh, one of the nice things you can do in Nomad is you can color the figures. Um, just directly, you don't have to use image maps. 
Um, but when I tried to open the figures in Lightwave in, in order to, to set up the scene, uh, none of that coloring carries over. They all, they all come out sort of shiny gray. Like, uh, remember that, uh, remember Diamond Life by Sade? Like, she's sort of covered in graphite. <laughs> That's what they look like. Yeah, I mean, because it's not mapping the uh, the texture right. onto it, right? So it's it's a limitation of light wave, and I, I couldn't figure out how to get around it. So that per forced got me to uh, to setting up scenes in Blender, which I hadn't been familiar with. And Blender has a lot of really nice features. It has really nice light. So I mean, I think it it's overall game, but you know, just going in and relearning all the stuff that I did, you know, more or less instinctually, or, you know, that was pretty much a muscle memory from lightweight. Having to learn that all over again has been just uh, kind of a slog. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the frustrating things about, I think, uh, programs. I, I did, this is years ago, like one of my first art jobs um, was doing CAD models of spa parts. This was like before I went to college for art. And mm -hmm. um, and that was a drag. Um, and and I very quickly forgot most of what I learned because it just didn't feel like CAD isn't. I, I I'm glad there are 3D programs um, that are a little more artistic at least I think now because it does seem like there's a little more sculpture to it. Um, um, well, you know, the, the, there's different ones. Um, Nomad, which is the sculpture uh, app that I'm using, that you know that I created that. Uh, human figure in mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty intuitive you know you have these brushes that do different actions you can crease them you can inflate areas uh, you know you, you can kind of drag them out um, it's very similar I had been working uh, in another app called Sculptress for a few years um, and and yeah, it, it is pretty intuitive uh, and, and, and really, really satisfying to use, but it's, you know, it's not much good for creating, um, you know, very geometric shapes like chairs. I mean, I guess you could do chairs in it. Um, but one drawback is that you're pretty much, uh, you know, condemned to a very, very high polygon count which isn't much of a problem for me because my figures aren't moving, you know, just the camera is moving around them. But if I had to animate them, then I think imagine it, I imagine that would slow everything down. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That, that could also be problematic with like 3d printing too. Right. Cause you usually want like kind of, kind of smoother. Um, yeah. And you know, they, they also have um, actions you can do that can reduce the polygons to an extent. Um, I, I belong to a nomad Facebook group and a lot of what I'm seeing are people, uh, u using their figures to, to, to do 3d printing. Oh, cool. Which is okay. not something that's ever <clears throat> much interested me. Um, I, you know, I kind of like, I kind of like that the figures stay in the computer and, uh, you know, aren't cluttering up my studio. <laughs> That's true. Um, I I think it's of interest to me just for like my my day job kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, and also I can't help but think like for conventions, it might be fun to be able to just run off like a print oh, of yeah. one of your characters or something. Yeah, you know? yeah, no, you were. <clears throat> Maybe that would be some merch. Um, I have to shout out to my daughter Rebecca. Um, she's graduating from UCLA this, this June and her first job is going to be in Boston, uh, working for a company that makes 3d printers. Oh, awesome. So I imagine I'll become more familiar with 3d printing just, you know, with the family connection. Yeah. That's not a bad connection to have either. Um, no, you, no. you, you can just be like, look, I need to 3d like, Actually, you might have to just hold back from asking for too many 3D prints because I, I would imagine just for fun, it'd be like, hey, could we also like three, like I'm going to scan my 
my head and I'd like a 3D print of it and <laughs> scan my shoe. Can you 3D print that? You know, I don't know. Yeah, my my son's looking at getting a 3D printer too. So I'm I'm probably gonna when he's not here, I'm gonna be trying to figure out how to make some cool 3D prints with that. It's gonna be like you you messed up all my filament again, Dad. <laughs> You're like, whatever, son, I'm making mad science here. <laughs> That's amazing, though. Yeah, that's that's an interesting. OK, OK, explain uh, what you're doing now, because this is that uh, you're, you're starting I, I to lay I'm the ground. I changing reels. I mean, there's there's some pretty long gaps here because, uh, you know, I, I, I have to take all the video and and uh, and, and send it to a Google Drive. And uh, if it's if the video is longer than 15 minutes, sometimes it won't load. <laughs> So I take a break every 15 minutes. Just as also nice to take a break. But here I'm, so what But what am I doing here? Am I uh, already at work on the, uh, on, on, on the revolving door? Yeah, it looks like you're laying the groundwork for it. Yeah, for the, right. for the revolving so door. Dimensions here. So um, the, the little square divisions, uh, I, I don't know if they're clear on the screen, but um, the, the little square divisions that are on what what uh, I guess stands for a wall uh, are six inches a piece. Um, so I'm figuring, you know, a center point, uh, you know, sort of a central axis and then, you know, three feet on either side of it to make, a, you know, a six foot space. And then, you know, building out, you know, three feet into the room to create, uh, you know, a, a, a base uh, circle. So I assume one of those squares is a foot? Uh, no? Each of those squares is six inches. Six so inches, okay. A foot. Okay. That's amazing. So, yeah, so I, I've figured you know a, a line a central line that extends into the room three feet so that you know that's i guess the radius of the circle so i'm just kind of uh drawing in the ellipse by hand i love it um one thing I like about the traditional method of this too, um, that you guys will be seeing as, as this gets further, um, it, it has a quality to it. Uh, when you, when you see the final, you'll, you'll see, but there's like a very classic quality to it that where there's a little bit of wiggle to the line. It looks more kind of, um, more gestural and like artistic, like it, it doesn't feel all rigid and geometric. Um, but it also like, you know, were you to just see that without the uh, the structure underneath, you'd be like, oh my gosh, this person just eyeballed like very quickly, perfect perspective. Like it's it's <laughs> it's got that kind of um, impressive quality to it. So I think the idea of building grids like this um, or working on grids like this is is a really smart way to kind of build out a room um, or or. or like honestly, any any sequence, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's that's very cool. So now I'm, I think because this is a, I think this is a, a perfectly balanced, a forty five degree, two point perspective. Um, the diagonal line, uh, diagonal lines will be perfectly horizontal. So they're just, you know, kind of parallel to. Uh, to the picture plane. So take us, uh, there, there, a lot of us will know, but many won't. Take us through the decisions that you're making on this grid. So you're in this grid and like when you decide your vertical lines, your horizontal lines, your lines that are diminishing to which vanishing point, like how do people decide? Well, it's, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're drawing a, uh, a perspective grid from scratch, then you have to think about this. Mm -hmm. but this, you know, this, all the decisions were made 
you know, in, in setting up the, the CG model and, and, and making the rendering. And I'm just basically tracing it the way I would trace a photograph. So I don't have to worry about where the vanishing points are. Um, you know, I just have to, to follow the, the lines that are already in the scene. And, you know, and if I want the measurements to be exact, you know, I have uh, the, the, the square divisions to do that. So, yeah, I, I, I've, I've done, I've been doing um, perspective videos uh, on my Patreon page for, I think, over two years. And a lot of the early ones are just, in, you know, showing me setting up perspective, you know, just basically starting with a, a blank page and, and, and doing lines with a ruler. But this is, you know, this is designed um, to, you know, to skip all that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think um, all of it has practical application. It, it's good to kind of learn the fundamentals of it, um, you know, but, uh also when when you're on deadline mm -hmm. on a book you know um it's like having things like this that are going to shave off like seconds of the creation or minutes of the creation when yeah. you're talking about like hundreds of pages or something it's like or or let's say it's a weekly strip or a web comic or whatever it is mm -hmm. like um an illustration for a client an editorial it's going to be like next day you know so it's like you know with um with with those kind of deadlines like something like this is a um it's like it's good to have those basics um mm -hmm. so that you understand like the concepts that are already presented before you on something like this um and but it's great to have something like this that's like a shorthand way of getting there a lot quicker mm -hmm. um I, I i just think it's it's really smart uh and, and the other yeah. side of this is that Having that figure there saves me, you know, a lot of labor and uh, and and heartache, you know, trying to draw the figure from scratch. You know, I of course I, I I'm limited by the pose, but you know, as I create more of these, I'm hoping that uh, this will be a more versatile tool. But even if even if the pose was different, it still is very helpful in seeing like like the proportions of the figure compared to the rest of the scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, she's about five, five. I think I usually do male figures around six feet tall. Although it, it can be hard to judge with uh, sitting or lying poses. Those are the beast when it comes to, um, to height. <laughs> I've definitely done some illustrations in my time where if you really picked it apart and the person like, you know, was laying down and they stood up, they'd be like hitting the roof. Oh, <laughs> oh that's definitely <laughs> happened. <laughs> I, this is, this is something that I see all the time and I, I just kind of have to disregard it, you know, but people do uh, cartoons where, uh, you know, you see children walking along and, uh, and, and behind them are houses that, uh, you, you know, that are in perspective or, you know, or that, that are, uh, you know, smaller from being in the background, but the peak of the roof, like, you know, doesn't reach to Nancy's chin. <laughs> and, you know, that's possible if you adopt a really, really low viewpoint, but there's nothing else in the scene that indicates the viewpoint is that low, mm -hmm. you know, but, the, but it's, you know, it it, it it bothers sticklers like me, but you know, the average reader just accepts it. I um I ac actually actually adore um what you used to do, uh, and and I think you still occasionally will do. But um, David for a while was doing like perspective police, and oh, so yeah. he would uh, take like a a well known cartoonist strip or or a panel and like correct their perspective, <laughs> and um. I, I, every time I'd see that post, I'd be like, I mean, 
it, it kind of put everybody on notice. I felt like for a while, <laughs> I, I I knew a couple cartoonists that were pretty afraid that you picked their work. <laughs> I've never heard back from anybody that I that I did that to. I, I you know, but of course I I usually pick people who were far more eminent than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good way to go. Um, yeah, that, but that was kind of fun, but it was a lot of work. So I I just kind of dropped it after a while. I still think that that's that's a pretty fun thing. Is that that's still archived though? People can still access that. I um, yeah, they're 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 still up on my uh, on my website, and mm -hmm. I, I think I actually put some of them on my Patreon page too. Hell yeah! So you guys should definitely uh, dig back a little bit and watch those. They're they're or or check them out. They're they're very fun. I was um, kind of hoping some publication would would like you know pick pick it up and have me do it for money but nobody ever did <laughs> that would be great you could take like every legend in comics and <laughs> just correct <laughs> correct their perspective I, um, yeah I there's have... a couple rules i well go sorry go ahead there's another oh, thing i, I want to really, bring up i had a really good neil adams one that i never finished that uh, maybe I'll, I'll 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 do that one oh i love it that'd be great um, I could, uh, I, I, I live in, in the Los Angeles area. So if you want, I could, I could bring a copy by to like Krusty Bunkers and just be like, this is for Neil from David. <laughs> 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 um, but, uh, um, the, the one thing I was going to say that I also think is a good sort of unspoken rule that, um, maybe it'll be helpful, um, for people sort of getting into illustrations like this. I like that you've made a conscious choice to, so you're using a ruler on the, um, on the structure, but when it comes to inking it, you're freehanding, um, without a ruler. And I know oh. why, but I want you to kind of explain why you might make a choice like that. Why? Oh, uh, because, uh, because the ruler just completely f f fucks the pen up. Like, well, I mean, if you're really, really careful, um, you can keep it from smearing the ink. It was easier uh, when I was doing rapidographs, but you know, now I'm doing fountain pens and there's just too much danger there. There's too much danger that I'm gonna wind up with, you know, a smeary line. So yeah. I wind I feel up freehanding it. I feel like that's a good aesthetic thing. Um, I, I usually use rulers for all of my like backgrounds and, and stuff, but um, on the book that I'm currently doing, I've made the conscious decision to use no rulers. Um, and so well, that doesn't mean- the, This is, you're, you're doing it all digital, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and so I'm so not gonna- to Just use the line tool. I know, but like, that's the irony of this whole digital. I'll, I'll show you what the pages look like. It'll make sense if okay. you see them, but-, um, but uh, I've made a conscious decision because I want it to look um, very like hand done and very organic uh -huh. and very like Victorian that right. I want it to look like somebody trying to do a straight line, but it's not a straight line. The only catch with that, um, and, and I, I think that works aesthetically, but I think the second you start throwing like super straight lines, it can throw off um, the, the like kind of organic feel. Oh yeah, well, the, and, and you know, the problem with doing really straight lines digitally is that's fine but even a slightly curved line is really hard to do i mean i i, I guess maybe with the current version of photoshop you can sort of bend lines but uh it's it's not it's not intuitive at all so you know you, you're going to wind up with a drawing that has very 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 rigid straight lines and very wonky curved lines. Exactly. Which is totally inconsistent. So you, you might as well make them all wonky. Yeah. Um, and, and um, yeah, it's, I, I feel like making them all wonky also has an aesthetic uh, mm -hmm. joy to it. And, and part of also the choice of doing that is as I've been doing, um, I've done two graphic novels so far that are just everything's ruled out on the edges. And then I keep reading graphic novels by cartoonists, like freeforming the edges. And it just looks so fun. Like it, it looks mm -hmm. cool and organic. Um, so I've been envious of that. 
Um, but I do think that's like just a good tip for people. If you're gonna if you're gonna rule out your lines like on your final, um, then you got to kind of commit and like get your circle templates, like rock that business. If you're gonna um, freehand your lines, then commit and just freehand your lines. Um, or you I could think just, it's just do everything in Illustrator. Yes, that's all. <laughs> It's all vectors. I, you know, I love I, I love the look of um, you remember you remember a cartoonist named George Price. George Price. He was I'm a New Yorker cartoonist, and he his stuff was very goofy, but very tight, very anal retentive, um, and he you know he back in the day. He just must have used, uh, you know, French curves and drafting tool, and you know, and everything is it's it's like the 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 kind of kind of like the clear line of Hergé, but this oh this yeah American version. It's interesting because you you know you imagine doing something like that now, where it's like a fairly consistent line weight that's very ruled out. Mm -hmm. And if you did that with like the pen tool and illustrator, it wouldn't take a, an incredible, I mean, he has incredible shapes, but it wouldn't take a long time, but imagine doing that organically. Like with, um, yeah, that's insane. Cause I like how, I, yeah, looking at this, I'm like, I also like how he's kind of, he's doing the fun thing where he's kind of messing with perspective a bit, but like in, in fun ways where it's like, I'm sure I'm going to show the top of the table but the side of the table and make that choice like design, you know, wise. It's, it's interesting. I like it. That's cool. Okay. Now I'm getting to the balloon. Ooh. I can't, I can't remember if I've, if I've actually written the copy yet. I, I usually start out um, without it written and, and hope inspiration will strike. And and hope that I get the syllable count right. So are you, so you're kind of you you haven't like pre-written out like what your what what, it, what your haiku is going to be or just you're winging the haiku. That's awesome. Kind of yeah. I, I I think at some point I decided. Well, at some point I decided. Okay, it's going to be a woman entering a a, a fancy store. So I have to, you know, come up with something about uh, how she doesn't want to spend money, you know. And uh, now I, I, this is a, you know, this was drawn a few weeks ago. I don't remember uh, what I wrote exactly, but it had something to do with Amazon is evil. We'll get to it eventually. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I do think it ends up being kind of a diss on Amazon. Um, I just think it's so fascinating to kind of see it built out. Yeah. Okay, so you you also make um, palindrome strips as well. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, and, and often they're written by my son. Who oh, nice. Has a talent for it. Um, I just learned literally this morning um that what the what the term for um uh basically like i think it's uh fear of palindromes okay is, it's <laughs> alifalia and it, it ends up being just the it's it's um uh philia as a palindrome at the beginning, but it's the official term for it. I thought that was hilarious. So it's A I L I H P H I L I A. So it's a palindrome. Oh, the term for it, but that's the official term. I thought that was hilarious. Um, but that's kind of cruel for people who, <laughs> who have a fear of palindrome. I think that's palindrome. somebody trolling. <laughs> I don't think that's a real condition. I don't know. I don't know. At least it was a meme, so um, I thought that was pretty, pretty lovely. Uh, and, and I imagine it's pretty impossible to tell whether a, a phrase is a palindrome or not, hearing it repeated. I mean, it's something that seems very specific yeah. to written language. Have you ever, David? You're 
you come up with um, some really fascinating concepts. Like uh, I was talking about this on a live stream somewhat recently where someone was asking me about like autobiography and um, autobiographical work and whether you can truly tell the truth when you're telling an autobiographical story. And I mentioned your theory on autobio comics where it's like, if you were really being sincere, you know, you, you had told me um, about like the, you'd actually be seeing everything from you, from the character's perspective. Like you'd never actually see the character except that if they were walking like by a window or something. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was so, so true. Cause it's like, that would be like the most accurate um, way to do an auto bio. But well, I, of course I, I didn't do that myself. That's true. I, I've done autobiographical strips. You know, I had this kind of blinding revelation after I did David Chelsea in Love that I, I, you know, autobiography should be, uh, you know, first person shooter. Um, and it kind of kept me from doing any more autobiographical strips. Um, but I've, I've done a couple where I've managed to do it, um, keeping myself out of the frame, but just shorter ones. And right now, I'm uh, one of the strips that I'm working on intermittently um, is a dream strip uh, where I'm just I'm mashing together a whole bunch of dreams, like you know, ten years worth of dreams. Uh, you know, just kind of creating that one long narrative that makes no sense, but uh, you know, I don't appear in it except for very occasionally in mirrors. I love that idea. Um, I, so I was curious, have you ever thought about trying to do an entire, um, I don't know, like maybe a 24 pager or something uh, uh, that's all a palindrome, like the entire story? No. You'd, no like at I the 12 not. page point, you'd flip it. <laughs> that would be insane. Yeah, that would be insane. I, I, oh shoot. What was that movie? where a character is like encountering himself backwards. Do you remember this one? It came out last year. It was really popular. I think Christopher Nolan did it. I oh, I have Tenet? I haven't not seen the header tail of it. Is it Tenet? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Which is a palindrome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Speaking of palindromes, I, there was a there was a book series um, that my that I used to get for my kids. It was written by Rhea Perlman from you know she uh, from Cheers. Sure. And I think she wrote palindromes. She, she wrote a, a children's series. I think I think I forgot how many there were. There may be like three or four of them. It was it was Otto somebody and he had a race car, both palindromes. And it was illustrated by Dan Sintet, which now has gone on to be like a Caldecott winner and everything. Uh -huh. But that was like one of his first, I think his first illustrated books, I think. But I just remember reading that book and it was really, it, it was really cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't hear much about it anymore, but it must not have done very well, but it was, okay. it was, it was a fun book series, but there was the whole thing, the whole book was just littered with palindromes and stuff. So it was great. I have to share my favorite palindrome that I ever came up with. This is one that I came up with that that, uh, that Ben didn't write, which was uh, Annie, uh, spelled A-N-I, so it's it's Annie DeFranco, gave Mark, M-A-R-C, uh, Mark Marin. Annie gave Mark a macrame vagina. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm trying to fit. I can't figure it all out in my head, but <laughs> I'm going to take your word for it. <laughs> That's so good. Oh man, when so when you're building these out, um, these sequences, do you have like a um, an idea of what it's going to be at the beginning, like as a scene, or are you kind of feeling that out as you go too? Oh, where you're like, I, yeah, I know what it's, it's going to be as a scene. I, you know, I don't know all the exact details but you know I, I i figure you know i know where the uh the front wall of the store is going to be and you know to make it easier it coincides with the wall of the room and yeah and, 
and I think I might have had some reference, like, you know, just calling up uh, Google Images on my phone. Yeah. Just out of frame. Uh, yeah, that's a good to bit, have. I'm a little bit hampered with these because usually I use my iPad uh, to look for visual reference, but I'm using my iPad as the camera here. That's that is tough. Um, yeah, what I what one of the things I've been doing with roughs um, when I'm compiling uh, references and stuff is like just putting them on like a million layers and then just sort of making like a cork board like on mm -hmm. a layer that's got like you know like um, Victorian era costumes and like the carriages that I have to draw and stuff. Um, but what I've realized from working digitally, um, which I have at at the place I work in house, but I don't have at my own house yet is when you're, when you're working on like an entire book on a, like digitally, it, it probably would behoove me to get a second monitor. <laughs> so I started realizing like I'm crunching all this stuff. Like my screen just looks like a madman's um, desktop or something. And it's like, I, I think I do need to invest in that second monitor so that I can like, have like references over there, drawing board over here. You know, I don't they're, know. They're they're fairly inexpensive nowadays. Yeah, like it it doesn't make sense that I haven't, except that I'm just I'm used ha having cut my teeth as a, as a freelance uh, a poor struggling freelance illustrator for years. I still have that bad habit of like even if it's like forty bucks, I'm just like I don't know. Do I really need for <laughs> like I caught myself doing that with a micron, um, like a a month ago where. I was doing the college thing of like, just like playing that micron out till it's just like dry. And I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> like I can buy other microns. Like this yeah. is the stupidest, thing. <laughs> but it's like an old, old habits die hard, you know? Where, oh yeah. Um, but yeah, that was something that dawned on me with, um, with that. <laughs> Sorry. Totally derailing us from, <laughs> from, uh, from the, um, what we're doing here sorry sorry about that that's all right so i, I, here, I love here i am drawing my straight lines by hand you know with a with a little of that uh, organic wobble in it that you love so much <laughs> i do think it's uh, so um so I, I I'll just be open about that. That is one of my pet peeves is like, if you're going to rule uh, a line in, in an illustration, when you're, when you're doing final, like if you're going to do a tightly ruled line, then just you, you know, you tightly rule all, all your lines that are like straight lines. Um, and, and similarly, yeah, just free freehand. Cause it just, you guys will see, but like the end result of this is just so much better because it's, it's consistent. Like, I love it. Um, shoot, I don't. Your your wobbly examples. line is way less wobbly than mine. Yeah. <laughs> when well, I, I mean, I've got these pre-printed. Uh, I, I, I've got these pre-printed lines to follow. That makes it considerably easier. So, um, I guess like. I'm trying to think um, what'll be useful because I think for like us, we're all visual artists looking at this and it's like, even seeing like you draw one item in the grid, it kind of instantly is like, yeah, that grid is super useful. Um, I'm trying to think if we should just kind of touch on like why that grid, like what is different about this grid for you like using these grids like how much time does that save you in the long run on on your art that's a good question i don't know because um i don't actually use them that often but then it's not that often that i'm doing a scene that um really needs rigorous perspective um, and it's, it's pretty quick to just set up, uh, whatever perspective I need. Um, you know, just, you know, just basically roughing it out. 
um, you know, this this kind of thing is is yeah, you know, it's a bit of a you know a demonstration piece. Yeah, it's very impressive though. I, I to me, the utility of it is really just really cool. But, one, of, yeah. one of my favorite comic book illustrators um, references your books as, uh, you know, what he uses to learn how to do this type of stuff. Sean Gordon Murphy, I've heard him mention it several times, Oh, Good which man. is kind of fun. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. I'd love to see, well, I'd look, I guess artists tend to be secretive. <laughs> about their methods. I mean, I'd love to see someone uh, posting uh, examples of where they built uh, their illustrations off of uh, the grids in my, in my perspective book. Yeah. I mean, these are kind of new, so I don't expect anybody's used them except for, you know, the, the people who are Patreon subscribers, but uh, most of them aren't artists. <laughs> Well, we do have uh, quite a few uh, cartoonists in the chats, and, mm -hmm. and I, I would, and a, a lot of cartoonists would watch after too. Um, I'd encourage you guys to be subscribed to David's um, Patreon. It's full of a lot of great resources. Um, honestly, like a grid like this, to me, I'm looking at this, and I, I believe one of your other ones that I didn't opt to to do for this um, was like more of an overhead. Um, mm -hmm and happened to be like remarkably similar to a scene I just had to do um, for, for, um, for the graphic novel I'm working on it. And I was like, Oh man, I would have asked David for that. Grid. <laughs> Cause it would have just, it would have shaved off like half the time um, and made it like twice as accurate, you know? So um, that's, I, I think these are very useful. And, and um, aside from the fact that, I think what's cool about your Patreon is you're always posting like um, it's a very like artist's uh, perspective on things where you're, you're playing with different mediums and different um, formats mm -hmm. of cartooning. And it's, I don't know. I feel like it's like a love letter to cartooning, you know? Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I looked up quite a few different, when I was learning how to draw a couple of years ago, I, I looked up quite a few different, um, books and everything and it it all read like putting an old 80s stereo instructions together and it was terrible i mean it was like it was for engineers and it was for you know it was for architects and stuff and i'm like i anyway so when i came across your book it was it was such a breath of fresh air because it was in clear language and there was like a logic that i understood because you're speaking to artists and it literally literally was mind-blowing i mean we we referenced your um we referenced your spiral staircase and uh i i had understood the basics of things prior to prior to all of that but that was the first time i was like i'm probably never going to draw a spiral staircase but i hadn't realized in my mind that what was making my stuff look so weird and rigid was that everything was on a grid and so having those staircases, each step turn and having each object have its own set of perspective or own set of vanishing points along the horizon, that opened up everything for me. And it was like, you know, and, and anyway, everything about those books was so drastically different because um, everything else just felt like this ivory tower nonsense that was just, you know, way beyond anything that I wanted to know or could even understand and i got to yours and i was like it's still very complicated but explained in such a simple way mm -hmm. um that i just immediately started grasping layer and layer and layer and layer of things it, it helps so much that's great so when you're doing like leaves like the ones you just drew um mm -hmm. how do you how, like this is a struggle for me it's the, and i feel like you have a, a good balance of it there how do you decide like where to kind of pull back on on the level of uh, of noodling on on like the leaves because you're giving just enough information not overdoing it like 
is that just like having drawn like leaves of trees yeah. like a billion times or yeah and you know i've looked at i've got some um like stock art i've got some great books that are like from the 80s or from the 70s that are just uh you know like stock art uh, people and cars and environments and I I like the way this one artist draws his his leaves and his plants and I just sort of copy that but it's in you know it's you know I don't make uh, you know a, a, a detailed uh, botanical study I, I couldn't tell you the species of of these trees they're just sort of generic um, I have my own notion that one reason that a lot of artists find perspective so challenging is that I think the part of your brain that draws figures and understands them is, you know, on the other side. Uh, and, you know, and perspective is like that analytical, geometrical, mathematical side. Yeah. And that's one reason why, uh, it's so hard to integrate figures into perspective. You know, people tend to think of their figures and their backgrounds, but they don't have that three-dimensional sense of figures in a, in a setting. And I think that's why, uh, you know, the people that put together those reference books never consider, uh, you know, having backgrounds behind uh, their the their, their models you know for them it's it's all about helping the artist draw the figure correctly and you know possibly possibly some assistant is going to do the first uh, do, do the background yeah so it's for basically like mangaka artists working in like one of those giant studios where you're like okay i did my figures here you draw the crazy backgrounds <laughs> like which you know i don't, I don't, the know that, the, uh... I don't know much about uh manga methods they you don't generally have the same artist doing the whole thing start to finish it varies but a lot of the big houses they have like uh full studios of like five artists on a book and they'll have like mm -hmm. you know one artist that's doing key figures one artist that's doing like background figures another artist that's doing backgrounds so it's kind of more similar to like animation um the way they've mm -hmm. kind of broken up the system and then there, just like in the u.s there's also indie cartoonists who do everything um and uh yeah but like the bigger houses i think they usually split like the background duties um but it's which it, which is the envy of most uh artists who don't like doing backgrounds but i will tell you guys like um if you're watching this and and let's say you're like just you know delving into illustration or cartooning um backgrounds is like one of the big unlocking points for comics it's like if you can get to where you can draw figures and environments multiple times from different angles um and and let the environment be a part of the story the lighting be a part of the story all of that it just like it levels up your stuff um and i feel like um you know yeah, you'd be missing um, like a whole realm of uh, information by like kind of losing backgrounds, um, which, by the way, was a hard learned lesson for me, because I think my earliest comics were a lot of talking heads, you know, because I wanted to draw faces. I didn't want to draw backgrounds. Yeah, yeah no, no, I'm no different. I mean, you know, if you grow up, I don't know, looking at uh, Peanuts or Garfield, actually, Peanuts is, 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 is pretty good. Uh, Schultz could really draw, draw backgrounds if he wanted to. Oh yeah, he's he's stripped things down so far that uh, you know the degree of drawing knowledge he had was kind of invisible, and I think uh, a lot of people who followed him just just picked up on the simplicity and the flatness, and they never got beyond that. And you know, and then they're they're you know artists who. Uh, cut uh cut their 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 figures off at the neck and that's what a lot of my early strips were like yeah it's it's one of those things of um uh like it, it i it's kind of like the artist journey where we we have to kind of start by doing things wrong 
and then learning the hard way that all the guys who've been at it were right <laughs> like <laughs> about perspective about anatomy um everything um and i feel like i um my journey as an artist has been like stumbling my way into learning those things because you know i and and, and falling into them kicking and screaming but also being very thankful to learn them um, even traditional inking, I think, is like one of those things. Um, this is, I I feel like this has been very enlightening too, because even the point you're at here, I think a lot of artists um, say they watch like a speed video. Um, they might assume that you just like 10 minutes in are here, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, and they're just like, I don't know how, how that magic trick is done. Um it's still impressive and amazing, but I just really appreciate that you're going to be offering this for, uh, for your Patreon subscribers and for people who, you know, because I do think it's, it's helpful for people to see behind the curtain, see the structure and the, and the time um, put in because it's like a slow and steady thing where yeah. it builds into something very impressive, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, the thing I haven't mentioned before, he said, I'm probably listening to a podcast through that whole thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not that uh, my full concentration is on this. I think actually the only time I turn the podcast off is when I have to write the haiku. <laughs> that sounds about right. Um, yeah, I feel like I, it's been interesting doing uh, streaming when working. But if I'm not streaming when I'm working, I'm I'm definitely listening to audio or I think we've talked about this like the um sometimes I'll listen to a lot of music and I think mm -hmm. we had a shared love for uh for tr corny trio music. I think oh, I really? said corny trio music and then you handed me a mixed CD that literally said corny trio music. <laughs> <laughs> Cuz I was like, I you know, I'm kind of into like corny trio music are you and you're like uh <laughs> anyhow, um but uh, I, I think like having something audible to kind of, I don't know, it's almost like we're distracting ourselves from, from the labor of it um, and keeping mm -hmm. in that zone. Because I, I do feel like if you think too much when you're drawing, that's when you screw up. And if you think too little, you screw up. So you have to get in that kind of, mm. that musician zone, you know, where you're not overthinking the chord, but you're remembering the chord, you know? What podcast would you be listening to on this? I guess I could turn the volume uh, on. No, I, I muted the whole thing. Okay. And and I, I had the earbuds in, so I, I most likely had earbuds in. So what do you think? What do you think? the uh, Do you have any uh, go-tos that you'd recommend for you know, artists? I, I, I listen to Omnibus, the Ken Jennings, John Roderick one a lot. And they put out a lot of content. They put out... Uh, two episodes a week that are usually uh, just over an hour. And uh, I also listen to, sometimes I listen to the uh, Mike Pesco one, The Gist. And usually the Slate Political Gab Fest. I fit that one in. Uh, there's really, you know, there's some that, that aren't weekly that sort of come up intermittently. Decoder Ring is really a good one. You know that. You know that one. I don't. I'm. I'm like literally making a list as you're saying it because I'm a That's podcast another junkie. That's so. one. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I listened to John McWhorter's Lexicon Valley, which is a podcast about language. You know, and I, 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 I barely have a second language. I, I, I can sort of babble a little bit in italian but he's he's very he's very interesting he's he's clearly just in love with with languages and the little quirks that each of them have and he can you know talk about the difference between uh you know all these different click african languages and uh and even though i'm you know totally incapable of speaking any of them you know his his enthusiasm is very infectious I love that. I, I feel like that's kind of what makes or breaks it with the podcast where it's like, yeah. if you get a really good one where the people are very passionate about the subject. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, you know, like one of my favorite go-tos is just like radio lab, which is just like a science. Well, that's a great geek. One, yeah. yeah. 
um, but they're so passionate in their presentation that they could talk about like quantum physics and um, as somebody mm-hmm. who like d- dipped into physics, but never again, like the creative math uh, problem that we, that you mentioned earlier. It's like, for me, it's like when it got, when physics got into math, it got way less interesting to me. The concepts are amazing. Um, and I, I feel like when you have the right person who's passionate about um, a complex topic like that, it, it can kind of, um, mm-hmm. demystify it and make it really interesting. Um, I, I feel like you do that with perspective too, where it's like perspective can be pre- presented in a very cold, calculated kind of mathematical way um, that feels like geometry, which can feel like homework to a creative. Um, but I think the way you kind of bridge it and and speak to creatives is really helpful, you know? I think Let's see. I don't know a, a good podcast about the visual arts i think the 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 form is is uh not that suited i mean there are great music podcasts yeah um i really like uh, an, another slate one is hit parade Ooh. okay write that down i i'm just gonna have to check out slates uh because I, I actually haven't yet yeah, i think my yeah. um yeah that sounds pretty yeah, their Sounds weekly culture show is really good. Although I, 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 I tend not to listen if they're, if they're talking about something I know I'm going to see or I know I'm never going to see. So there's, there's sort of a sweet spot. I, you know, sometimes I'll I'll listen only after I've seen something. But they ha- they have an interesting dynamic. I think uh, what you just did with the figure is really helpful too, where it's showing how you can take like a basic structure of a figure and then kind of build out from there. Yes. Um, yes. You, you, you need not feel that just because, you know, the figure is naked <laughs> that uh, your drawing has to be of a naked person. Right? You know. I think there's a lot of people who might just prefer drawing the naked person, <laughs> but, oh, yeah. well, but I mean, that's, that's what, that's basically what superheroes are. You know, yeah. Naked people uh, painted green and blue. <laughs> that's that's actually uh, more accurate than not. <laughs> Is, okay. Is there a superhero who paints his costume on? There has to be. And if there hasn't there has been. There has to be, right? There's, uh, there's Silk, and she's she's one of the Spider-Man variants, and she just sprays web on herself whenever she goes out. That's, okay, that's, that's close. You know, that's that's modesty. I I, I, I kind of like this. the idea of an yeah. indie comic where you have superheroes who literally just paint on their costumes. I used to watch this uh, reality show, reality competition show, where it was body painting. Uh, you know, and, and they start with naked models, and then you know paint them to look like uh, rhubarb or, uh, you know, or, or, you know, snails or something. Um, I just can't believe that there's that much work out there for body painters. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if we're talking like, if this were like the very beginning of the 1970s, there, there was like a gallery scene where you might be able to get away with that. <laughs> I um, guess, but they, I mean, this show is sort of pretending that you can like get, jobs in the movie business or something oh body. just painting pot or painting bodies that's an interesting and, uh, i mean there's another one that uh that is creature makeup which you know i think there actually still is uh yeah. you know a, a business like face off or something yeah that... there's there, there's so many of those the thing that bothers me is there's so many of those shows like there's there's ones on tattooing there's ones on like glass blowing and all these different things but the, mm-hmm. No one's ever done one on comics. So I, I there mean, was there was one attempt. There was a, a web series ago. one. There was oh, a there web was series. One, there was one called Stri- Was it called Stripped? Yes. Yeah. yeah it was uh, a web series. And but, Erica yeah. Moen was in it. I think there were a couple other cartoonists in it. Um, yeah, that was that was pretty interesting. Like that um, that web series. I I wish that had kind of continued. Or like instead of it being like a, a reality show like contest type thing, it might be fun to just have like. I don't know. I, I guess there is there's woke on Hulu now. That's good. That's about cartoonists. Oh, is it? Woke is? I yeah. Oh, okay. I 
to check well, that it's out. Keith Knight. It's Keith Knight. Isn't it sort of like young Keith Knight? Isn't it yeah. like Keith Knight as a child? I haven't watched it. I haven't watched Sorry, it either. <laughs> but I think it's a I think he's a bit older, but not quite where he's at now. So Oh, I thought it was like everybody hates Chris or something. <laughs> Shows you how much I know. <laughs> but you might be right. Um but uh but yeah, like I I, w- I do wish there was a little more about cartooning like in, in popular culture. Well, that I'll, wasn't okay. just I'll, I'll I'll plug a comic that I did uh on my Patreon like five years ago. Uh I, I did a, a comic about reality TV called Are You Being Watched? And part of it was a reality show called Twenty Four Hour Comic where everyone competes to draw the best twenty four hour comic and I, I made it so that I'm the host. So, you know, I, I'm the guy who is who's who's passing judgment on everybody, everybody's 24 hour comic. I think were that to be a series, that would be a very appropriate choice. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, uh, we should also mention that. Like, uh, I, I mean, we've mentioned it before, but there's a very great documentary on 24 hour comics featuring David Chelsea. You guys should check that out as well. I feel like this door, it's fun to see how like little segments of it have come through through the process. Okay, quick question on um on this on this drawing. Do you prefer to kind of get see like the general structure kind of worked out and then work your way into the details? Or do you like kind of building each item at a time? Like what, what's kind of your preferred method? Well, I think I've, um, I did an overall, like, you know, an, an overall structure. I didn't just like work right to left. Like, uh, I, I, I figured where the, uh, the main wall was and you know the main features those the potted trees yeah uh, i i think I, I left what was in those windows for last so you know just just a tiny area you know i i i can start the drawing without knowing what's going to go in it i think actually i took a pause to to call up more uh, visual reference on my phone but now I'm I'm starting to pencil in that, even after, you know, inking much of the rest of it. Yeah, I just I it's so fascinating to see. I still have trouble with cylinders, even after watching this. <laughs> Do you guys, Scott, Corey? Uh, ellipses and perspective are still the bane of my existence. I just, yeah. I mean, it makes sense in theory because you're kind of breaking it with its two axis points, right? And then kind of from there, like the center of that. If you, if you have a square in perspective, do you have trouble inscribing a circle in it? Yeah, if you put it in a cube, just imagine everything in a cube. What you know, that's usually how to. The, the tricky part is like, like back when I was talking about chairs, mm-hmm. drawing a chair is okay, but if the chair is slightly askewed, that's where to me I run into a problem because you don't want to. It's not like if you walk into a room, every chair is going to be perfectly. Oh well, lined up on that grid. You know? Yeah, then then you're getting into multiple perspectives and yeah. you have to set up more vanishing points yeah I, I i made it easy for me uh in this picture by you know not including any you know anything that's really not following the grid except you know except the the doors in, inside the revolving door you know they're exactly 45 degrees but i i, I did not include any any chairs turn slightly. Yeah, I mean, definitely the trick I'll use is is the the taking, you know, first doing a square and then just sort of carving off the corners. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but it's like I still I still am impressed with like the 
just very um, geometrically like on point um, ones that you do. It's, it's still very impressive. Well, now here's a question. Does anyone want to tackle something like this themselves? Because I I'd love to put up uh, e either a speed demo or a full length video of, of somebody else um, taking you know maybe one of these uh, figure pieces and uh, and working it up into a drawing. Ooh, I love that Don't idea. Once, but uh, it would be uh, it'd be fun for me to see. Yeah, depending on the timing, that might be something that I'd be interested in. Mm -hmm. And maybe when I start the next issue of my comic. Oh, Let's yeah. See. I mean, that would be... Well, I, I don't know what your comic would need. I mean, you, you could, you could, you'd have more it, flexibility just starting with a, with a plain perspective grid. But, you know, if, if any of the ones that I posted or, you know, in, in, any of the ones that I'm uh, working on uh, have a figure that actually meets your needs. <laughs> I, I mean, well, every, you know, the, 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 there's lots of instances where you might have a character uh, just walking, which is, you know, really all that the figure is doing in this picture. It's true. I, I think I'm going to, I'll keep an eye out because I have like 200 something pages I have to draw this year. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, so anyhow, I'm imagining there's got to be one panel at least yeah. where maybe I can find a way to know, there, work it in. Is there a in. scene where a character is shot out of a cannon? Because I, I, the one that I posted after this is this guy sort of, he, actually the model is leaning on a balloon so with his stomach against it, with his, with his arms behind him. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that pose is supposed to be, but to me it looked like a guy being shot out of a cannon. I love it. I think um, this has just been so enlightening so far. Uh, I, it, there's something um, fun about seeing the structure of art build itself and not having to be the one to build it. <laughs> it's, <fun. laughs> it's like I don't often get that opportunity anymore, you know. So it's 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 beautiful to see, um, and it and. It, it's reminding me that uh, art is a bit of a magic trick and, and it, it is really, it's, but it's a beautiful magic trick when done well, you know, like you see a good magician who's got good sleight of hand. And like, if you were like kind of practicing magic tricks or even doing it professionally, you still are going to like, look at a good magician and be like, Holy crap. That's amazing. Um, it's fun to see. Yeah. I love how Penn and Teller like always explain their tricks, you know, but you know, it's still awesome. Oh, Penn and Teller. Yeah. They could literally tell you exactly what they're doing and it still looks like magic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love that. Uh, I just, I also like the fact that, you're you're setting up one of like you you set up challenge it it feels like each one of these sets up a challenge for yourself like to be like okay i'm gonna show this challenging thing that's that or a challenge for at least demonstration of like how you would overcome something like a spiral stair uh, not a spiral staircase a um, revolving door um or how would you deal with like i think one of the other ones i watched was like a guy sort of like passed out on the floor <laughs> um but the but the angle of the figure creates some perspective challenges of its own there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I is that kind of one of the deciding factors for these videos? Where you're like, I'm gonna kind of take on something different and challenging, like in this image, or does that just happen? <laughs> well, it's just you know sometimes the pose suggests something. Um, but I mean, really, I mean, they're all three, the whole reason I, I took on this project is because uh, it's actually difficult for me to integrate figures into perspective. <laughs> um, you know, just to, to decide, um, you know, I mean, without, without you know, completely, uh, you, you know, 
putting the character in a box and doing all kinds of, a, of measurements, like, you know, just from my head, figuring out the foreshortening and how the foreshortening, you know, is going to fit into uh, the perspective of the scene. I mean, that's really, really hard to do um, without reference. And, you know, and most of the time you don't have reference or you, fi you find reference, but then uh, it doesn't fit with the scene that you're, you know, it doesn't fit with the perspective of the scene that you're trying to do. So, you know, having done all the work of sculpting the figure and placing it in the scene, uh, you know, and, and getting the proportions just right, you know, I know that I don't have to invent that. I don't have to guess at that. I can trace the figure and it's going to look plausible. I love it. Yeah, I, f I find that, um, you know, I don't know, Corey or Scott, like if you guys have this too, but I find that like one of the ways I'll, I'll stay engaged on a long book um, is to set out to like challenge myself with something that I struggle with on different pages, you know, where it's like, I, uh, I haven't drawn a, a horse at this angle. I'm going to draw a horse here, or I haven't drawn, you know, whatever it is. It's like, if it's like a paneling challenge or a type challenge, but I do feel like that's a really good way to kind of, um, not only like level up as an artist, but also just retain your own interest for the long run on, on comics. Cause comics are a long slog, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think any tricks you can use to kind of keep yourself engaged and growing as an artist, it's, it's, um, it's brilliant, you know, to, to kind now, of do. You're working from someone else's script on this new project. Is that right? Or are you? Yeah. 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 So yeah, it, it actually ended up being my sister's um, script that she had written when she was a senior editor at a newspaper, but she had this like obsession with the Brownings. And um, and then uh, I read her script and it was a little after I got my literary agent. I was like, uh, I'm going to show this to my literary agent because it's good. And when I talked to my literary agent, of course, the reaction was like, well, it's like your sibling. So, you know, and I'm like, no, no, no. I like I promise you this isn't that kind of scenario. Like if you see this, you're going to want to represent her. Mm -hmm. And I showed it to them. And then like there was like a phone call within five minutes of like, we need to represent you. Like <laughs> it's really good. Um, but yeah, so uh, so that's what we're working on. So it's it's a historical fiction. It's co-created, but it's uh, the stories by her and the art's going to be me. So. Yeah. And, well, I mean, when you write your own script, you can tailor it towards uh, what you'd like to draw. Yeah. Um, you don't have that there. I mean, maybe you have some influence, but, um, I mean, have you found, have you found either that uh, you're steered into drawing stuff you'd rather not have to, or that uh, the script... Uh, presents a challenge you know that you welcome so i think that uh and i i mean you're you're familiar with this david because it's like you've you've done a ton of illustration professionally too so in illustration it gets you pretty comfortable with like somebody being like uh you need to we need a picture of a coliseum and you're like i've never drawn a okay and you want people in it okay <laughs> like you know you get kind of comfortable with taking on challenges that um, mm -hmm. seem unfeasible, but you just sort of start going with it and figuring it out as you go. Um, so luckily I've, I've been doing that for long enough to where I feel pretty comfortable with a challenge, but there, I mean, it's already really interesting um, because I've done mostly auto bio and slice of life stuff. It's really interesting that the switch Mm -hmm. to um to historical you know well, like that that's a, that's probably the weirdest part because there's every action in it requires a ton of research <laughs> well i mean even autobio requires research i mean at least the way i did it you know yeah i went you know i was living in new york at the time i went back to portland and you know shot lots of polaroids of uh, you know of, of places that i'd been um you know just because i wanted to get the details right 
um, you know, there was only a gap of about a decade between um, the this, this story and, and when I was drawing it. But, you know, I tried to, actually, I, I, I don't think I bothered to get the car models <laughs> in period. Maybe another 10 years and that would have been uh, something I worked harder at. Yeah, it's, it's like, I, yeah, that book is really incredible, though, because of that. It's very, like, period accurate in what it's representing. And and the, the, there's specific things for each location. Like, if you read it and you've been in Portland, there's enough of it that's so accurate to Portland that you're like, oh, that's totally Portland. Enough of it that's accurate to New York that it feels like New York to probably a New Yorker, as opposed to, like, somebody outside of New York just being like, ah, that's New York, you know? Like, <laughs> um and somebody from New York being like, that's completely Los Angeles. It's just a set. Like, it doesn't have that feeling to it, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm finding the extensive research where it's like, um, it, what dawned on me the difference was there's a plate of food and I'm like, crap, I don't know what dinner, like she has a plate of food at that's, that's at, like at a... Uh, um, <coughs> at a table that's next to her. So now I have to look at Victorian era table from like 1850s um, because there's no reference of that. And now I have to figure out what kind of food did they have like for her class status? Like how did they serve that food? What would the leftovers look like for that? Like for somebody who's been holed up in their room for a long time. It's that level where I'm like a little blown away by it, but I kind of love it because I, I think... Is this is, you know. and, and, and uh, your sister provided no indication. It's just, that's, that's kind of a, a lot of times what, what writers do is they sort of airily indicate uh, what, uh, you know, what should be there. And uh, it's, it's up to the artist to actually figure out what that would look like. Yeah, I, I mean, that's part of the beauty of us being co-creators on it, because I have to invent a lot, but um, luckily there's like an understanding of that, because um, that's part of why I don't tend to do like comics for hire, um, per se, because it's just usually that <laughs> that exact scenario. Whereas like for an illustration, it's okay to have a phone call and be like, hey, when you say this, were you thinking, or, or just kind of work that out and do the research. Um, but yeah, that is, that. I guess... The worst, I, I guess she's a better client than I am, though, when I write my own scripts, you know, so. Well. <laughs> like, David, I, you know, yeah, your books. I've not worked much with uh, with uh, uh, other writer scripts at all, so I, I don't really know the process. I think, uh, you know, being your own writer uh, saves you a lot of description or, or indication like you don't really have to give instructions to the artist the artist uh, knows your intentions all, all too well totally totally um yeah i agree yeah that that is uh that is like a little bit of a change but so far it's been pretty smooth i'll let you know when i'm at the halfway point and maybe uh maybe i'll have a different story <laughs> mm -hmm. But so far, it's been fascinating. And it's been feeding that part of me that likes like podcasts and uh, like a lot of information and stuff. Because I mean, I love like BBC Panorama and stuff. So it's like being able to kind of create something like that is fun. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a fun change of pace. Um, but I'm going to try to use one of these grids at some point in in the in the process because it would be very helpful <laughs> how much uh, more time do you think you have on the project before it's going to be done that one yeah oh my goodness um a year cool <laughs> so. i'm i i figure if i hit about 15 to 20 pages a month i should be good so well <laughs> we'll see i have you uh you're doing it digitally so i suppose you can reuse figures <laughs> yeah yeah that's true yeah I and see. i'm definitely going to do some cheats that i don't often do which is like re repeating like cutting and pasting backgrounds and stuff that are repeated yeah. oh it looks like it looks like the end. It looks like I, I, the piece is all done. 